Hi, my name is Hugo, and this is the sixth part of my series on classical China about the emperor Wende. In the autumn of 180 BC, Liu Heng, the 22-year-old king of Dai, travelled south in a convoy of six carriages, heading towards Chang'an. He had come from Jinyang, the capital of his frontier kingdom, and it was his first time going back to Chang'an since he had been made king of Dai at seven years old. And the journey he was making now was not an ordinary pilgrimage to visit the emperor, as the other kings of China often made when stability allowed for it. He was answering an urgent summons. Two months earlier, Empress Daoji Liu, the widow of Liu Bang, and most powerful person in China, had died. In the weeks afterwards, some of the high ministers, men who had been followers of Gao Zhu from the early days, executed a coup which resulted in the purging of all the members of the Liu family in the capital. It seems now that they intended to replace the boy who currently sat upon the dragon throne, Ho Xiao Di. When Liu Heng had first received the summons, he had been nervous, unsure of what to expect. His chief attendant and other members of his court had feared that some trouble might befall him if he went to Chang'an, and begged him to make some excuse and remain in Jinyang. They warned their king, quote, The great ministers of Han were originally generals in the time of Emperor Gao Zhu. They are experienced in warfare and given to plots and deceits. In short, they could not be trusted. However, one courtier, Song Chang had spoken in favour of going, and after talking with his mother, consulting the tortoise shell, and sending someone to scout the situation in Chang'an, Liu Hang felt more comfortable about going. Thus, he had set out and arrived in Chang'an on the last day of the ninth month. When he crossed the Wei Bridge just outside the city, he was greeted by an illustrious crowd. The head of the military, Supreme Commander Zhou Bo, and the Chancellor of the Right, Chen Ping, Marquis Sleri Zhang of Shu Zhu, and others who had been involved in the coup, were there to greet him. The assembly bowed before Heng, who dismounted from his carriage and bowed in return. Zhobo asked Liu Heng if he could have a word in private, but Song Chang, still suspicious, insisted that if Zhobo wanted to discuss a public matter with the King of Dai, then there was no reason it could not be discussed in the open. With that, Zhou knelt before Liu Heng and proffered the imperial seals, making the situation clear to all. The conspirators who now held power in Chang'an had decided that Liu Heng, the King of Dai, should be the next Son of Heaven. Probably quite embarrassed, Heng said that they should discuss the matter further in his private lodgings. When they arrived at the residence, Liu Heng sat facing west while the rest of the assembly faced east, the proper arrangement for hosts and guests. Those assembled presented Heng with their assessment of the situation. Ho Xiaodi, the boy now inhabiting the imperial palace, was not really a member of the Liu family and ought not to be emperor. After much discussion, they had settled on Liu Heng, the oldest living son of Gao Zhu, as the best replacement. Now, in situations such as these, it was of course the polite thing to do to refuse the opportunity to become emperor. Even Gao Zhu himself, a man whose ambition had driven him to conquer the heartland of the Qin dynasty, and had then spurred him to initiate a four-year civil war, had declined three times before giving in to the pleas of the other kings for him to take the imperial throne. But Liu Heng seems to have been genuinely reluctant. He replied, quote, It is a grave task to undertake the service of the ancestral temple of Emperor Gao Zhu. I am a man of no ability and am not worthy to be appointed to such a charge. I beg you consult with the king of Chu and select someone who is suitable. I dare not undertake the task. But the assembly prostrated themselves before him. Three times he refused. Then, the standard histories say, the seating arrangement was changed. Liu Hang faced south and the rest north, the proper seating for a king and his ministers. Third century AD commenter Ru Shun says that this indicates that Hang was acquiescing to their requests. But 13th century commenter Hu San Sing says that Liu Hang had been compelled by force into the new arrangement. Even after the shift in seating, he refused two more times before finally agreeing. 
men were sent to vacate the Weiyang Palace of its current occupant, and by sunset, Heng was entering his new residence. It turns out that Song Chang had been correct when he had first advised Heng to go to Chang'an. When the summons had first arrived, Song had painted a picture of a dynasty that had overcome its major burping challenges and now stood firm, ready to stare the future in the face. And indeed, Liu Heng, as Emperor Wen, was able to build on this solid bedrock, and throughout his 23-year-long reign, a reign longer than those of all the previous Han rulers combined, he governed China with dedication and concern for the well-being of the country, allowing the people a sense of stability and even prosperity. He went down as one of the most beloved rulers in the entire history of the empire. In this episode, we'll discuss the important features of his reign. Wendy was most celebrated for his personal conduct as emperor and his liberal policies. He was influenced by Confucian thinking and believed that the role of government was to guide the people to a better life, with the officials from the emperor on down leading by example. He also continued the lenient laissez-faire approach of his predecessors, Hui Di and Empress Liu, and took it even further. Before we get into these topics, though, I need to mention a peculiar feature of the dating of Wendy's reign, as practice changed a bit from previous rulers. So, up till now, we've spoken about events happening in the nth year of so-and-so's reign. The Chinese, like many ancient cultures, named years after the reigning monarch. To begin with, Wendy followed this practice. However, in his 17th year, 163 BC, Wendy decided to start counting his years from the beginning again. Thus, we have a former period of his reign, consisting of 16 years, and a latter period, consisting of 7. It was not a revolutionary move. Some kings during the Warring States had done similar things. To make things simpler, I could just count them all together as one thing, but I feel like that would be a bit dishonest. So when we're talking about something that happened from the former period, I'll say, in the nth year, and when we're talking about something from the latter period, I'll say, in the nth year of the latter period. Anyway, I'll always give you the Gregorian equivalent too, so you shouldn't get too lost. If you remember from last episode, at the start of Hui Di's reign, it became illegal to sentence children or the elderly to mutilating punishments, tattooing, cutting off the nose, and amputation of the feet. When Di rose one better, he abolished mutilating punishments entirely in the 13th year of his reign, 167. Wendy was inspired to make this decision when the treasurer of Qi, Lord Chun Yu, was sentenced to punishment for some crime, the details of which have been lost. Lord Chun Yu had five daughters and no sons. When he was sentenced, he mouthed off at his daughters, saying that it was his bad luck to have fathered no sons, who would perhaps have been able to get him out of his current predicament. The youngest of the daughters, Ti Ying, was so upset by her father's situation and his hurtful words that she joined the party that escorted him to Chang'an for punishment, and when she got there she wrote a letter to the government, begging that the emperor forgive her father and instead take her in as a slave an attempt to show that a daughter could, in fact, be of use to her father. Wendy was so moved by the letter that he issued an edict abolishing mutilating punishments, substituting them with beatings that would not permanently injure the convicted. We are not told what happened to the girl or her father. Wendy's edicts are famous for their very striking emotional and philosophical style, and both Sima Chan and Ban Gu quoted them extensively in their chapters on the emperor. The one on the mutilating punishments is a really fine example, and it goes like this. I have heard that in the time of the sage Emperor Shun, only painted robes, caps, or different kinds of uniforms were prescribed as punishment, and yet none of the people violated the laws. Such was the excellence of his rule. Today, the laws impose three types of mutilating punishments, and still evildoers do not desist. Where does the fault lie? Is it not that my virtue is insufficient and my teachings lacking in enlightenment? I am filled with the deepest shame. Thus it is that if the leadership and guidance of the ruler are not sincere, the people in their ignorance will fall into crime. The Book of Odes says, Just and gentle is the true prince, father and mother to his people. Now, when men have some fault, punishments are imposed upon them before they even have been taught what is right, so that although they may wish to mend their actions and do good, there is no way open for them. I am deeply grieved at this. Punishments which extend the cutting off of limbs or the piercing of flesh, leaving the victim maimed for life, are unspeakably cruel and unjust. How can a ruler, who countenances such things, 
be called a father and mother to his people. Let the mutilating punishments be abolished. Wendy's claim at the start there that punishments were insufficient to prevent crime, and what was really needed was virtuous leadership, was very much a Confucian ideal, in contrast with the legalist thinking that had dominated the Qin dynasty. Empress Liu had abolished an ordinance against evil talking, basically a law that made criticising the government a crime. In his second year, 178, Wendy abolished the ordinance again. The Chinese had a lot of written legislation, and it wasn't very well organised. In the Book of Han, there are instances of complaints from later years that, quote, Writings and documents filled tables and cupboards, to the effect that even officials well versed in the law did not know what to apply. The legal texts gathered dust and became moth-eaten on the shelves, so nobody was able to peruse them all. If this was also the case early on, remember, the Han had inherited a lot of Qin law. It's not hard to imagine that Empress Liu's abolition of the ordinance hadn't succeeded in wiping it from all the books. In his edict abolishing the ordinance, Wendy exhibited a deep insight, that if people were afraid to criticise the government, then the government was missing out on opportunities to improve itself. I'll read this one too. Quote, when the dynasties of ancient times ruled the empire, they set up in their courts the flags for advancing good and the boards for recording criticism. These are avenues for people to inform the government of their opinions. In this way, they were able to carry out their rule successfully and to invite criticisms of their policies. The present laws, however, recognise a category of offences known as criticism and evil talk, and because the officials are afraid of being accused of these, they do not dare express their feelings in full. The emperor accordingly has no way to learn of his errors. Under such circumstances, how can I expect to attract worthy men from distant regions? Let the laws pertaining to these offences be abolished. The edict went on to say that, even, shall we say, less constructive criticism, such as a group of peasants gathering together to place a curse on the emperor, was a harmless thing, born of ignorance, and should not be met with punishment. I'm almost tempted to call Wendy a champion for free speech. In the second year of his reign, 178 BC, following two eclipses, one solar and one lunar, which Wendy took as a divine warning that he was failing as a ruler, he issued an edict which included a plea for people throughout China to present their critiques of his rule and send able men to Chang'an. Quote, Wherever this order shall reach, let all give thought to my errors and consider in what way I have fallen short in understanding, vision, and thought. I beg you to inform me and to select for me wise and upright men who will speak frankly and reprimand me, that I may repair my shortcomings. He went even further in his 15th year, 165, when he set an exam so that talented men could be found and employed by the government. According to the Book of Han, quote, an imperial edict ordered the vassal kings, the ministers, and the commandery administrators to present to the emperor those who were capable and good, and could speak frankly and admonish their superiors unflinchingly. The emperor in person questioned them by setting a literary exercise. They set forth in written words their ideas for adoption. This was the first instance of examination to judge meritorious men in the Han Dynasty, and was the beginnings of the famous civil service exam that is iconic of imperial China. However, it was not until the reign of Wendy's grandson, Wu Di, that the examination system became a standardised and regularly occurring event, rather than a one-off tool. Another legal reform, from the first year, 179, concerned the punishment of criminals' families. For the most serious crimes, parents, spouses and children could all be sentenced to punishment alongside the criminal, usually state slavery, but even execution was possible if the crime was something like treason. Empress Liu had declared an end to the practice of executing relatives. Wendy extended the principle and forbade the enslavement of criminals' relatives as well. His edict on the topic is another illustration of his virtue. What's perhaps more interesting, though, is that in the records, we're also provided with the words of Wendy's ministers, who argued for retaining the punishment. It's really fascinating to me to see these words from ancient people justifying a practice that seems archaic and completely immoral to us. Here's the section from the records. In the twelfth month, the emperor announced, Laws serve to ensure the justness of rule, 
for they restrain violence and guide men of good intention. But at present, when a man has been found guilty of violating a law, his parents, his wife and children, and the other members of his family, though they are guilty of no offence, are brought under accusation as well, and even forced to become slave labourers, I find this practice utterly unacceptable. Let the matter be brought to discussion. The officials concerned with such affairs all replied, The people are incapable of governing themselves, and therefore we must have laws to restrain them. The practice of joint accusation and joint punishment is intended to trouble the hearts of the people, so that they will regard violations of the law with proper gravity. The system has been in use for a long time, and it is expedient that it is continued as before. The Empress said, It is my understanding that if the laws are just, the people will be obedient, and if the punishments are meet, the people will comply. Moreover, it is the duty of the officials to shepherd the people and lead them into good. If the officials, having proved themselves incapable of such leadership, should in addition punish the people in the name of laws which are unjust, they would become, on the contrary, injurers of the people and the doers of violence themselves. How then could violence be restrained? I cannot see anything expedient in such a system. Let the matter be examined with greater care. The officials all replied, Your Majesty would bestow great mercy upon the Empire, and manifest such virtue as we could never hope to attain. We beg to draw up an edict abolishing the statutes pertaining to the system of joint accusation and enslavement of relatives. Sadly, Wendy's abrogation of the punishment was short-lived, and the practice was revived under later emperors, and, just to destroy Wendy's image as the perfect enlightened despot, the principle of joint accusation wasn't entirely abandoned when it came to the worst crimes. Wendy was tempted to, and did in fact apply it on occasion. One time, a man stole a jade ring from the funerary temple of Gaozu. He was taken to the superintendent of trials, Zhang Shiji, who recommended that he be executed and his body exposed in the marketplace. When Zhang reported his judgment to Wendy, the emperor was infuriated, not because he thought it too cruel, but because he thought it too soft. He cried, quote, In stealing objects from the temple of the former emperor, this man is guilty of the most heinous offence. I sent him to you expecting that you would recommend the death penalty for him and all the members of his family, but instead you recommend only the sentence prescribed by the statutes. This is hardly my idea of the proper respect to show for the ancestral temples of the dynasty. Zhang Shiji was able to convince Wendy not to punish the man's family by pointing out that if they used it now, there would be no greater punishment that could be inflicted in the future if someone committed an even more serious crime, such as stealing a handful of dirt from Gaozu's funerary mound. Another instance in Wendy's reign, when the execution of a criminal's family was actually carried out, was the case of Xin Yuan Ping, who faked a number of divine portents in order to win favour with the emperor. When his ruses were discovered in the first year of the latter period, 163 BC, he was executed with his three sets of relatives. There's another instance in the records where we get to see Wendy's ministers argue in favour of an archaic practice. The debate was over Wendy's heir. It was usually the case that a man's title passed on to one of his sons, preferably to his eldest son or the son of his official wife, but in the end, the father could choose which of his sons he preferred. When Wendy was king of Dai, he had been married to a woman of the Liu family, who had given birth to four sons, but she and her sons had fallen sick and died before he became emperor. In the time since her death, he had not chosen a new official wife. All he had as children were those by his concubines. In the first year of his reign, 179, the officials asked Wendy that he nominate one of his sons as heir apparent, saying it was for the good of the empire, and they weren't wrong. If Wendy were to unexpectedly die, it could be a bit troublesome if no heir apparent had been nominated. However, Wendy was hesitant to make a decision. He said to them, quote, I am without virtue. The Lord on high and the other spirits do not accept my sacrifice, and the people of the empire have not yet found satisfaction for their desires. Now, though I may never be able, like the most ancient rulers, to search far and wide throughout the empire for a man of true wisdom and virtue, to whom I may cede my throne, Yet to announce at this early date that I am setting up an heir apparent would only be to emphasise my lack of virtue. What would I say to the world? Let us let the matter rest a while. It was said that the legendary sage emperors had searched far and wide for meritorious men to succeed them, 
rather than just choosing their own sons. Wendy wasn't looking to go that far, but he went on to say that it would be better to pick one of his brothers or uncles, who had already had experience ruling their own kingdoms, rather than to choose one of his sons who hadn't yet proven his worth. But the officials insisted that Wendy decide amongst his sons, and reach a decision soon. They said, quote, When Emperor Gaozu in person first led his followers and ministers in bringing peace to the world, he set up the feudal lords and himself became the great founder of the imperial line, while all the kings and marquises, who first received grants of territory in turn, all became the founders of their respective lines, that their sons and grandsons should succeed them generation after generation without end is a fundamental principle of the empire. Therefore, Emperor Gaozu established this practice in order to bring order to the entire area within the seas. Now to pass over the rightful successor and instead choose someone from among the feudal lords or the other members of the imperial house would not be in accordance with the will of Emperor Gaozu. We do not consider it right to deliberate further on the question. A bit of a fallacious argument, and I'm sure it wouldn't convince any moderns to support hereditary absolute monarchy, but in a society where filial piety was considered one of the highest virtues, saying it's what your father would have wanted was a bit of a trump card. Wendy was persuaded and chose his eldest living son, Liu Chi, as his heir. A few months later, Liu Chi's mother, Lady Dor, was appointed as empress. The other area that Wendy made some strides in was the economy. He reduced both taxes and state expenditure. The Chinese of this era faced three main types of tax. A land tax, which was a portion of a landowner's produce. A property tax, which was a percentage of the value of someone's property. And a poll tax, which was a flat rate tax on simply existing. Aside from the land tax, which was paid in kind, that is, the physical crop that the farmer produced was taken by the government, all other taxes were paid in cash, probably because it was easier to transport to the capital. Having to pay taxes in cash was a bit of an extra burden for the poor farmers who made up the majority of the society. In order to pay them, they either had to grow enough so that they could sell some of their crop, or they had to give up time on their farm to do some paid work elsewhere. By the way, I should mention that all these taxes were in addition to annual labour service and military service for men, which I've talked about in earlier episodes. Yeah, the Hanshaw expected a lot of their subjects. Wendy, however, famously made things a bit easier. At the beginning of the Han Dynasty, the land tax was set at one fifteenth of produce. In his second year, 178, Wendy halved the tax for that season, reducing it to one thirtieth. This was done again in 168, and the following year, the tax was abolished entirely. It was not brought back till after he had died, when it was brought back at the rate of 1 30th, which remained the standard rate for the rest of former Han. In the edict denouncing the tax reduction of 178, we can see Wendy's economic theory articulated. Quoting from the Book of Han, Agriculture is the great foundation of the world. It is what the people depend on for their very life. Nevertheless, the people sometimes did not apply themselves to the fundamental, but occupy themselves with what is least important, that is, working as a merchant. As a result, their livelihood is deficient. We are anxious about this state of affairs, hence we now at this time ourselves lead our ministers in agricultural pursuits, in order to exhort them to stress agriculture in their government. Let there be granted to the people of the empire this year half of the land tax on the cultivated fields, if people were starving, it was seen as a result of insufficient supply, rather than inadequate distribution. The traditional antagonism to merchants and traders may have ignored the role they could have played in buying grain where it was plentiful and selling it where it was needed most. Nevertheless, the tax cut was surely a boon to a lot of people, though it should be noted that it would not have made much difference for the very poorest people in society, peasants who had been forced to sell all their land and instead rented from a local landlord. These unfortunates would sometimes have to pay as much as half their entire crop to the landowner. Wendy also made a change to the poll tax, though I've seen two different interpretations as to what this change was. Historian Junshu Zhang says that Wendy reduced the standard poll tax, which was demanded of men and women between the ages of 15 and 56. It would have been a reduction of 120 cash to 40 cash. However, historian Nishijima Sadao says that the reduction was on a special additional poll tax for unmarried women between the ages of 15 and 30, 
which we mentioned last episode. The reduction would have been from 600 cash to 40. Of course, I don't know who to pick. Now, I'd just like to make a bit of an estimate about how much this poll tax would have meant for the ordinary peasant family. There's a line from the Book of Pan which states that a family of five, including two men eligible for labour service, meaning over 15 years old, could manage to farm at most 100 mu, that is, about 11 acres of land, and from this they could expect a maximum crop of 100 shi, or 2,000 litres. Grain prices are always volatile, so setting an average price doesn't count for much. Nevertheless, I'll use historian Jun Xu Zhang's figure, which puts the average price for shi of grain at 150 cash. In other words, our family could at best expect a crop valued at about 15,000 cash. So, let's say our family has a mother, a father, a boy above 15, and two other children. This would mean three people have to pay the standard poll tax of 120 cash, so 360 total. There was also a poll tax on children, 20 cash a head, so 40 total. This brings us to an overall total of 400 cash owed in poll taxes for our family of five, about 2.7% of the value of their crop. If Wendy did in fact reduce the standard poll tax to 40 cash, we're looking at 160 total, or 1.1%. It might not seem like much, but again, we're assuming that they were able to produce a good crop and sell at average prices, and neither of these can be taken for granted. Finally, Wendy reduced the corvée labour obligation from one month a year to one month every three years. At least, I think so. I've only seen one historian make this claim, and unfortunately the section of the book of hand that he cites is unavailable to me. I guess if it did happen, it probably got reinstated back to one month a year after Wendy died. But anyway, Wendy, what a cool guy. Lest you start imagining that Wendy was a stubbornly small government type ruler though, He's also celebrated for his development of some rudimentary forms of welfare. In the first year, 179, he published an edict declaring his concern for the destitute. Like Sima Chan and Ban Gu, I'm also an admirer of Wendy's edicts, so I'll quote this one again. This is from the book. Just now it is spring, when nature is harmonious, and the plants and trees and all living beings have means of enjoying themselves. Yet among my subjects there are widowers, widows, orphans, and childless, distressed and suffering people, and some at the point of death, but no one goes to look at their suffering. What should those who are the fathers and mothers of the common people do about this situation? Let it be discussed what are the means to aid and lend to them. Unless the aged have silk, they will not be warm. Unless they have meat, they will not be well nourished. Now, at the beginning of the year, if we do not at the right moment send people to visit, and ask about the health of the elders and aged, nor make grants of linen cloth, plain silk, wine, or meat to these people. In what way can we assist the children and grandchildren of the empire in filial piety to care for their relatives? Now we have heard that officials, when giving grain to those who should receive gruel, sometimes use stale millet. How can this befit the intention of caring for the aged? For all these matters, you should prepare ordinances. It seems that there was already a system that provided certain classes of destitute people with rice or gruel. This system was to receive greater attention to ensure that they were being provided with quality stuff. In addition, people over 80 were newly granted a monthly allotment of rice, meat and wine, and those over 90 also received silk for making clothes. And while Wendy put more resources into provisions for these unfortunates, he also cut back on expenses that he deemed unnecessary. A solar and lunar eclipse in the second year of his reign, 178, were taken by Wendy to be a warning from heaven that he had not been governing the empire well. In response, he instructed his officials to, quote, strive to reduce their demands in labour and expenses in order that the people may be benefited. One step taken in the early years of his reign was to encourage Marquises who were residing in the capital to move to their various fiefdoms. The physical act of transporting the Marquesas' revenue from their fiefdom to the capital was an expensive and labour-intensive process, a cost which could be saved if the Marquise resided in his marquisate. This proposal was suggested by the rising star academician G.R. Yi, and I wonder if he may have also had the ulterior political purpose of removing the ministerial old guard who opposed him from the capital. Decreases in expense were also used as a method of disaster relief. 
In 158 BC, the Xiongnu raided some Chinese provinces, and there was also a drought and a plague of locusts, ruining the harvest. In response, Wendy announced that the king would not be required that year to pay their annual tribute, and reduced spending on luxuries and attendance in his own court. He also opened up state granaries and storehouses to the poor, and allowed great access to the resources of the mountains and lakes, which were considered the personal property of the emperor. But the cutbacks that really endeared traditional commentators to Wendy were those in his personal life. In his own frugal living, he embodied the principles of his economic policy and the virtues he wished to encourage in his subjects. He wore plain clothes to encourage frugality. He ordered that his mausoleum be simple so as not to waste the resources and effort of the living on the dead. And he established rituals whereby the emperor personally ploughed a field and the empress raised her own silkworms to encourage people to produce fundamental food and clothing. His humility was not just in his material consumption, though. Throughout his reign, he always denigrated himself in his edicts, blaming himself for natural disasters, evil omens, and bad harvests. In the 14th year, 166 BC, he brought a stop to the practice of people praying for the well-being of the emperor. The edict announced this as a great illustration of his general attitude. Quote, Though the kings of ancient times spread their goodness abroad, they did not seek any reward. Though they sacrificed to the mountains and rivers, they did not pray for their own fortune. They honoured the wise above all, and considered their own kin second. They put the people first, and themselves last. Theirs was the highest order of wisdom. Now I have heard that, when the officials pray for blessings, they ask that all the good fortune may come to me in person, and say nothing for the common people. I am deeply shamed by this. Am I, who am without virtue, alone to enjoy good fortune and receive blessings, and am I people to have no part in them? This is only to double my lack of virtue. Let the sacrificial officials conduct their duties with all due reverence, but let them not pray for such blessings. One might be inclined to think that this sort of prostration was some sort of cynical political theatre, but I haven't seen any historians make such a claim. Most believe he was genuine in his humility. Burden Watzer, the translator I'm using for the records, says, quote, His edicts are model expressions for the Confucian ideal of the good ruler, full of humble protestations of his own lack of virtue, and pleas for guidance from his ministers and his people. They were written, I believe, in all sincerity, and should be read in that spirit. Though I admit that this may be difficult for anyone familiar with the endless vain and hypocritical imitations of them, which fill the annals of later Chinese rulers. That Emperor Wen did not always succeed in living up to the sentiments proclaimed in his edicts is obvious from the anecdotes related about him in the chapters dealing with his ministers, but this is hardly a reason for doubting the sincerity of his purpose. Now, I'll talk about some of the problems that Wendy had to deal with in his reign, and how he handled them. First, we'll talk about his foreign policy. Once again, the nomadic Xiongnu Confederation in the north featured as China's key rival, and there were also happenings involving the Kingdom of Nanyue, the Chinese splinter state ruled by Zhao Tuo, who was still alive and kicking. During the reigns of the previous Han rulers, the Chinese and Xiongnu had reached a shaky peace agreement. Shaky, because while the Chinese rulers tried to spin it as a peace between equals, they were at this stage militarily inferior to the Xiongnu, and when push came to shove, they could do little more than capitulate to Xiongnu demands. Furthermore, the Shan Yu, the leader of the Xiongnu, held a lot less authority over his subordinates than his Chinese counterpart, and even if he was willing to keep the peace, it didn't stop the odd Xiongnu raiding party from making a flurry into China. When he assumed the throne, Wendy was concerned about the frontier. In that edict from 178, the one following the two eclipses, he said, quote, I have been unable to extend the practice of virtue to distant regions, and I brood with anxiety upon the misconduct of foreign peoples. However, he was also intent on reducing expenditure, a reduction which was to be achieved in part from spending less resources on the army. 
To compromise, in that same edict, he resolved to maintain the frontier garrisons as they were, not to train any more soldiers, and to disband some of the segments of the army that operated as his personal guard in the capital. Perhaps the time was not yet right for Wendy to economise on the army, though. In the third year of his reign, 177, a faction of Xiongnu, led by a subordinate of the Shan Yu, the wise king of the Rai, launched a large invasion of the northwesterly regions of China. A Chinese army of 85,000 cavalry, commanded by the Chancellor, Guan Ying, the same Guan Ying who had been a key player in the coup against the Liu's, succeeded in driving the Xiongnu back. Over the following years, envoys were sent to Mao Dun, the great Shan Yu who had united and was still leading the Xiongnu, in order to renegotiate a peace agreement. In one letter to Wen Di, Mao Dun claimed that, while the wise king of the right had invaded without permission, he had been provoked by Han officials on the border, who had treated him insultingly. That letter also contains a quite striking section, wherein Mao Dun describes how he punished the wise king of the right by sending him to conquer neighbouring tribes. It was a piece of rhetoric that simultaneously showed Mao Dun's willingness to work with China, while bragging about the strength of the Xiongnu. Quote, Because of this violation of the pact committed by the petty officials and the subsequent events, I have punished the wise king of the right by sending him west to search out the UAG people and attack them. Through the aid of heaven, the excellence of his fighting men, and the strength of his horses, he has succeeded in wiping out the UAG, slaughtering or forcing to submission every member of the tribe. In addition, he has conquered the Lawland, Wu Sun, and Hu Jiet tribes, as well as the 26 states nearby, so that all of them have become part of the Xiongnu nation. All the people who live by drawing the bow are now united into one family, and the entire region of the north is at peace. After this reassurance that the Xiongnu were greater and more powerful than ever, Mao Dun said that, as he was now approaching the winter years of his life, he wanted nothing more than peace between their peoples, and was only waiting to hear what the emperor's intentions were. Wendy deliberated with his ministers, pondering whether the Chinese should negotiate, or if they should invade the lands to the north. His ministers were intimidated by the Xiongnu's recent conquests of other tribes, and, furthermore, argued that even if the Chinese launched a campaign against the Xiongnu and were successful, the territory that they would win was wasteland, unsuitable for the Chinese agrarian lifestyle. Persuaded, Wendy sent a letter to Mao Dun, agreeing to a peace. In typical Chinese fashion, he tried to maintain the semblance of de jure authority over the barbarians. He told Mao Dun that as Shan Yu, he need not punish the wise king of the right on the emperor's behalf, and he congratulated Mao Dun on his victories over the other tribes, presenting him with luxurious clothes from the imperial wardrobe as if they were a reward. In 174 BC, Mao Dun died and was succeeded as Shan Yu by his son, Jizhu. In accordance with the Heqin peace system, Wendy sent Jizhu a Han princess as a bride, accompanied by a eunuch from the kingdom of Yan, a region in the northeast that had historically had a lot of interaction with the tribal peoples of the steppe. This eunuch, Zhang Hang Yue, had a fairly interesting relationship with the Xiongnu. He ended up acting as something of an advisor to them, helping them implement some of the more sophisticated administrative techniques from China, such as making records of the number of people and livestock in their domain, while also giving tips to Jizhu on how to act superior to the emperor. One amusing example of this involves the letters that Wendy sent to the Xiongnu, which were written on wooden tablets, and began, The Emperor respectfully inquires about the health of the great Shan Yu of the Xiongnu. Zhang Hang told Jizhu to reply on larger and more elaborately decorated wooden tablets, and begin them with the even more grandiose phrase, The great Shan Yu of the Xiongnu, born of heaven and earth and ordained by the sun and moon, respectfully inquires about the health of the Han Emperor. Now, if you've studied a bit of ancient history, and if you've listened to a bit of Dan Carlin, you've probably already heard the Voltaire line that history is the story of wooden sandals ascending and silken slippers descending. Basically, the idea that cruder, more militaristic societies are able to rise to prominence, only to lose their martial virtues and consequentially their position, as they grow accustomed to the soft living that their victories won for them. I'm not going to debate the validity of the idea, What's important is that many societies have held this belief and acted upon it. What's interesting about the Chinese case is that, unlike, say, the Greek view of the Persians, or the Roman view of the Greeks, 
where a rustic society considered a more sophisticated one to be weak and decadent. The Chinese recognised themselves as the more sophisticated culture with the softer way of living, and they believed they could use their attractive lifestyle as a lever in managing simple barbarians and bring them into the fold. Rather than the silken slippers being a Chinese weak point, they could be used as a weapon to sap the martial quality of their opponents and make them obedient to the emperor. Jia Yi, the scholar who had advised Wendy to send Marquises away from Chang'an, he was also the guy who wrote The Faults of Qin, which I quoted at the end of the episode too, promoted a strategy embodying this principle in his political treatise, Sin Shu. He believed that by sending the Xiongnu Chinese goods, and the emperor on his part treating them well, the common Xiongnu could be turned away from his leader and towards the Chinese. From the Sin Shu, quote, When the esteemed people of the Xiongnu see the Khan, the Shanyu, it would be like meeting a tiger or a wolf. When they face south and give allegiance to the Han, they will be like weak children yearning for a foster mother. When their populace sees its officers, it will be like suddenly meeting an enemy. When they turn south in a desire to flee to the Han, it will be like water flowing downward. Zhang Hangyue, when he started giving advice to the Xiongnu, warned them about these plans to use Chinese culture to disrupt Xiongnu society. Quote, all the multitudes of the Xiongnu nation would not amount to one province of the Han Empire. The strength of the Xiongnu lies in the very fact that their food and clothing are different from those of the Chinese, and they are therefore not dependent on the Han for anything. Now the Shenyu has this fondness for Chinese things, and is trying to change the Xiongnu customs. Thus, although the Han sends no more than a fifth of its goods here, it will in the end succeed in winning over the whole Xiongnu nation. From now on, when you get any of the hand silks, put them on and try riding your horses through the brush and brambles. In no time your robes and leggings will be torn to shreds, and everyone will be able to see that silks are no match for the utility and excellence of felt or leather garments. Likewise, when you get any of the hand foodstuffs, throw them away so that the people can see that they are not as practical or tasty as milk and kumis. There's no word on whether the Shan Yu took this advice to heart. And, in fact, at some point, officially sanctioned border markets were created where the Xiongnu could trade for Chinese goods. Historian Yan Yingxi says that, quote, It is clear that the border market system was imposed on the Han by the Xiongnu, though he acknowledges that the system would have theoretically served Jiayi's strategy of corrupting the Xiongnu with Chinese material products. Anyway, for a few years the Chinese and the Xiongnu remained at peace with the Chinese sending the Xiongnu gifts of silk and grain. However, in 166 BC, the Xiongnu broke the peace, launching a massive invasion with an army of 140,000 cavalry, personally led by Jiju. They penetrated deeply, and their scouts even reached the Ganchuan Palace, an old Qin summer retreat within sight of the capital. Wendy was able to rapidly mobilise an army of 100,000 infantry and cavalry, with a further thousand chariots to guard the capital, he spent time in person among the troops and gave gifts to the officers to raise morale, and he wanted to lead the army himself, though he was persuaded by his mother not to. The army made to attack the Xiongnu, but the nomads would not engage them and eventually went back to their homeland. We are told in the records that the Chinese were not able to kill a single man of the enemy. For the next several years, the Xiongnu repeatedly raided the northern provinces and kingdoms, murdering civilians and stealing livestock. In 162, Wendy was able to elicit another peace agreement from the Xiongnu. In his letter to the Shan Yu, he still attempted to portray the hand tribute to the Xiongnu as an act of magnanimous beneficence, citing the cold and unfertile land of the Xiongnu as a reason why the hand should send them food and clothing. However, he had to concede political ground. He addressed the Shan Yu as an equal, saying that it was the divinely mandated task of the two leaders to govern their assigned halves of the world. He referred to an agreement supposedly made during the reign of Gaozu, whereby, quote, The land north of the Great Wall, where men wield the bow and arrow, was to receive its commands from the Shan Yu, while that within the wall, whose inhabitants dwell in houses and wear hats and girdles, was to be ruled by us. And in the edict announcing the peace, he said of himself and the Shan Yu, quote, Together we have cast aside our petty faults, and together we will walk the higher road of virtue. 
we have united ourselves in bonds of brotherhood in order to preserve the multitudes of the world. Despite Wendy's lofty words, this piece proved to be as fragile as the last. Jiju died a few years after this piece, and was succeeded by his son Jun Chen. Wendy sent another Han princess, as part of the Heiqin Pact, but this Shan Yu was eager to prove himself. In 158 BC, he launched another invasion, though this one was much smaller than the previous one, just 30,000 cavalry. They pillaged and abducted a lot of Chinese, and though a number of armies were quickly raised in response, the Xiongnu were out of there before anything could be done about them. One interesting thing about this incursion is that we have the first mention of signal fires being used to warn the capital about the invasion on the frontiers. With these, messages could be sent from the border to Chang'an in less than 24 hours. The fact that the new Shan Yus tended to break the peace agreements with the Chinese was probably a consequence of the nature of political authority in the Confederacy. Although the position of Shan Yu was hereditary, and Yu Shan Yu couldn't rely solely on the authority he inherited from his father, he needed to prove himself in arms and provide the Xiongnu nobles with war booty. If he failed to do this, it was likely that he would lose his political standing among the Xiongnu aristocracy, and may even face a challenger to the position of Shan Yu. Jiaoye and others warned Emperor Wen that the relationship with the Xiongnu was approaching a critical moment, when something would have to be done to decisively break their power. But it was not for Emperor Wen to achieve something like a turning point against them. He died before the next major Xiongnu raid. Obviously, this was an issue that was still unresolved, and a threat that would loom large in the minds of Wendy's heirs. Now, before we leave the Xiongnu for this episode, I'd like to go back to that eunuch who ended up advising the Shan Yu, Zhang Hang Yue. When I introduced the Xiongnu in the episode on Gaozu, I talked about how the Chinese usually saw them as the antithesis of themselves. Their customs were strange, and they seemed to have no understanding of proper morals. However, there were some among the Chinese who actually admired the Xiongnu. Rather than viewing them as hellish barbarians, they perceived Xiongnu society to be one of virtuous simplicity. Zhang Hang Yue seems to have held such opinions. And because what we know of Zhang Hang and his beliefs comes from Sima Chan's records, we can perhaps say that Sima understood these views, even if he did not hold them himself. Zhang Hang, after he had gone to the Xiongnu, was having a discussion with a Chinese envoy. He talked about the Xiongnu scornfully, and presented some of the typical Chinese criticisms against them. Zhang Hang blasted back with an impassioned apologia, and even presented the Xiongnu customs as superior to Chinese ones. Quote, According to Xiongnu custom, the people eat the flesh of their domestic animals, drink their milk, and wear their hides, while the animals graze from place to place, searching for pasture and water. Therefore, in wartime, the men practice riding and shooting, while in times of peace they enjoy themselves and have nothing to do. Their laws are simple and easy to carry out. The relation between ruler and subject is relaxed and intimate, so that the governing of the whole nation is no more complicated than the governing of one person. Among the Chinese, as etiquette and sense of duty decay, enmity arises between the rulers and the ruled, while the excessive building of houses and dwellings exhausts the strength and resources of the nation. Men try to get their food and clothing by farming and raising silkworms, and to ensure their safety by building walls and fortifications. Therefore, although danger threatens, the Chinese people are given no training in aggressive warfare, while in times of stability they must still wear themselves out trying to make a living. I don't have much more to say on it, but it's just really interesting to me that this different perspective on the Xiongnu existed. In a way, it's kind of like the noble savage idea. Though the Chinese may not have considered the differences between the Xiongnu lifestyle and their own in terms of progress, there's a similar sort of romanticism regarding the other, portraying it as an easier, simpler way of living. So, the other foreign state that Wendy had to deal with was Nanyue, and on this front, he was more successful. During the reign of Empress Liu, Xiao Tuo, the king of Nanyue, had caused a bit of trouble by menacing the border of the Chinese kingdom Changsha, and styling himself an emperor. The empress had managed to deal with the immediate military threat, but it did not sit well with the Sinocentric worldview to have the ruler of a relatively minor barbarian state calling himself an emperor, 
and riding about in a carriage that was an imitation of the one used by the Son of Heaven. Wendy's solution to this situation did not involve threats or force. He intended merely to guilt Zhao Tuo into giving up the title of Emperor and recognising the Han Emperor as his sovereign. He got started on the issue almost as soon as he came to the throne. Zhao Tuo had originally come from China, and his parents' graves were still there. When Wendy found out the location of the graves, he designated a nearby town as responsible for taking care of them and making sacrifices for them. He also gave members of Zhao's extended family who were still in China positions in the court in Chang'an. Then, he assigned a diplomatic mission to Nanyue, headed by Lu Jia, a literatus who had been sent to Nanyue during the reign of Gao Zhu and who was friendly with Zhao Tuo. Zhao was apparently frightened when the mission arrived and was very apologetic. He claimed that he had only attacked Changsha because he had heard rumours that the graves of his ancestors were being desecrated, and that his intention in styling himself as an emperor was not to put himself on the same level as the leader of China, but to elevate himself above the leaders of the smaller tribes that lived on his borders, who called themselves kings. He gave up the title of emperor and offered to pay annual tribute to Chang'an, just like the Chinese vassal kings. He kept this up for the remainder of Wendy's reign, and for the reign of Wendy's son, Jingdi. However, he continued to secretly use the title of emperor for business that did not involve contact with the Han. As far as Wendy's reign was concerned, though, there were no more major interactions between China and Nanyue. One of the most important trends of Wendy's reign had to do with the Chinese vassal kingdoms. Throughout the history of Han, these had always been a key topic of concern for the emperor. Gaozu had faced rebellion from a few of them, and tried to ensure the loyalty of the kingdoms by replacing their original monarchs with members of the Liu family. Empress Liu had subverted this during her reign by making members of her family kings, either by intercepting existing royal lineages or creating new kingdoms. Wendy, for his part, tried to lessen the threat that the semi-independent kingdoms posed by weakening them. Wendy, and his son after him, Jingdi, increased the territory controlled by the central government, and diluted the power of the kingdoms by making them smaller and more numerous. At the start of Wendy's reign, there were 19 centrally controlled commanderies and 11 kingdoms, fairly nicely divided between the western portion of China where the capital was, and the eastern portion. By 143, near the end of Jingdi's reign, there were 40 commanderies, which now reached the east coast, and 25 small kingdoms, often spatially separated from one another by the commanderies, Wendy, for his part, was able to kick off the reduction without much violence. As for how Jingdi continued the process, well, that's our topic for next episode. Wendy was warned about and advised on the potential dangers of the vassal kingdoms by Jia Yi. In Sinshu, Jia Yi recommended that Wendy, quote, while copiously establishing feudal lords, lessen their individual strengths. Jia Yi reckoned that by using this strategy, of increasing the number of feudal lords while making their kingdoms smaller, the emperor could diminish their individual strength while maintaining a good image. People would feel like he was being generous by establishing so many kings, while if territory was taken from an old kingdom to create a new one, rather than just put under the administration of a commandery, Wendy could avoid charges of self-aggrandizement, that he was merely taking territory from the kings and putting it under his own direct control. Although Jia Ye himself did not have a particularly successful career, mainly due to jealousy on the part of old yard ministers, Wendy acted on the essentials of his advice. At the onset of his rule, Wendy restored to the kingdoms of Qi and Chu, territory that had been taken away from them by Empress Liu. However, before even a year had passed, he started taking it away to make new kingdoms. He created two new ones out of the territory from Qi, and established sons of the former king of Qi, Liu Fei, as their rulers. Liu Zhang, the man who had sparked the coup against Empress Liu, was made king of Chengyang, and Liu Xingju, who had played a minor role in the coup. He had been the marquis who cleaned the palace of the boy emperor Hu Xiaodi, was made king of Jubei. In his second year, 178, Wendi also made two of his own sons kings, around the region that had been his old kingdom, Dai and a third son, King of Liang. In 177, Wendy faced the first and only proper rebellion by a vassal king in his region. The treachery was committed by none other than Liu Xingju, the recently appointed King of Jubei. You see, when Liu Zhang and Liu Xingju 
had gotten involved in the conspiracy against Empress Liu. They had hoped to make their brother, Liu Xiang, the King of Qi, the new emperor, and they had grand ambitions for themselves too. Liu Zhang had wanted to become King of Zhao, and Xingzhu had wanted Liang, territories that had been given to members of the Liu family. However, Wendy had given Liang to one of his own sons, and he had given Zhao to Liu Sui, the son of its former king, Liu Yu, the man whom Empress Liu had starved to death by locking him up in his rooms at Chang'an. Even though Zhang and Xingzhu had been made kings, their kingdoms were small, and they must have been disappointed not to have received the prizes that they hoped for. Furthermore, Wendy was aware that they had supported their brother to become the new emperor, and consequentially downplayed their role in the coup. Liu Zhang didn't get long to simmer in his resentment. He died shortly after being made king in 177, and was succeeded by his son. Liu Xingzhu, on the other hand, must have made up his mind to rebel against Wen Di when an opportunity presented itself. And soon enough, the opportunity did present itself. Remember, 177 was the year of the first major Xiongnu invasion of Wen Di's reign. On this occasion, Wen Di had travelled north so that he would be closer to the action, visiting the kingdom of Tai Yuan, which he had created for his son Liu San. When Liu Xingzhu heard that the emperor had left the capital, he imagined that Wendy intended to lead the army against the Xiongnu himself. Perhaps with the emperor preoccupied, Xingzhu would be able to achieve... something. So he revolted. But when Wendy heard of the revolt, he ordered some of the men he had sent against the Xiongnu to go back and take care of Xingzhu. Jibei was quickly invaded and its king imprisoned. Xingzhu committed suicide before his fate could be decided for him, and his territory was put under the control of the central government. In 176, the old kingdom of Huayang was restored as part of a reshuffle of Wendy's sons who had been made kings in the region of Dai. However, in 169 BC, the son who had been made king of Liang died, and the king of Huayang was transferred to Liang. The territory of Huayang once again fell under imperial control. Another opportunity to name a kingdom came in 174, the sixth year, when the king of Huainan, Liu Chang, was arrested. Liu Chang seems to have been a troubled man. He was a son of Gao Zhu, the only one still alive apart from Wendy himself. His mother, Lady Zhao, had originally been a concubine of the king of Zhao, Zhang Ao, before she was given to Gao Zhu as a gift. Soon after living with her new husband, she became pregnant. However, when Zhang Ao was implicated in the plot to assassinate Gao Zhu at Boren, he and members of his family, including Lady Zhao, were arrested. She protested that she was with child, but Gao Zhu was in such a fury over the whole thing that he ignored her, and she was chained and imprisoned along with the others. She asked Shen Yiji, Empress Liu's old lover, to plead her case to the Empress, but he did not put much effort into it. Eventually, she gave birth to Liu Chang. After this, she lost the will to live. Once Chang was born, she committed suicide out of anger for the way she had been treated. After the birth of Liu Chang, Gao Zhu immediately regretted the way he had treated Lady Zhao, and asked Empress Liu to look after the boy as if he were her own son. Perhaps surprisingly, given the Empress's treatment of Gao Zhu's other sons, she actually treated Liu Chang pretty well. The boy was made king of Huainan, a large region in the south of China, after the revolt of Qingbu in 196. During the reigns of Hui Di and Empress Liu, he grew up and was able to rule his kingdom undisturbed by the central government, due to the positive relationship he had with the empress. However, he bore a grudge for the death of his mother, and he directed that grudge at Shen Yiji for not having done enough to help her. Shen Yiji had had a successful career under Empress Liu, and even served as Chancellor of the Left for a few years. He was able to dodge the purge of the Liu family, and was even named Chancellor again for the short period after the purge and before the arrival of Wen Di in the capital. When Wen Di became Emperor, he named Zhou Bo his Chancellor of the Right, and Chen Ping his Chancellor of the Left. However, Shen Yiji was still able to reside in Chang'an, and enjoy the income of his Marcus Eight. Because the two were brothers, Liu Chang was friendlier with Wen Di than what was considered proper. When they would go hunting together, Chang would ride in the same carriage as Wen Di, and he addressed him as elder brother instead of emperor. 
However, because Wendy was just that sort of guy, he let Chang get away with this sort of impropriety. This only fueled Chang's ego, and he came to behave arrogantly. When he was in his own kingdom, he began to imitate the imperial court ritual as if he himself were an emperor. In 177, the third year of Wendy's reign, Liu Chang paid a visit to Chang'an, and when he was there, he asked to meet Shen Yuji. Shen, unaware of the grudge Chang bore him, agreed to the meeting. Chang, who was noted for his physical strength, concealed an iron hammer in his sleeve, and when he saw Shen, he struck him with it, knocking him dead. He then had an attendant decapitate the corpse. Before he could be caught, he went to the imperial palace to explain what he had done. He defended his action by saying it had been to avenge his mother. Avenging one's parents was usually considered a heroic act. And he also accused Shen of not having done enough to prevent the various evil actions of Empress Liu. Wendy was moved by Liu Chang's words and pardoned him of the crime. Yuan Ang, an outspoken member of the court, begged Wendy to punish Chang by taking away some of his territory so as to curb his arrogance. However, Wendy refused. After this, Liu Chang grew even more overbearing. He disregarded Han laws in a manner of ways. He appointed his own chancellor, a position in the royal government that was meant to be picked by the emperor. He sheltered criminals from other areas of the empire, and even made some of them marquises. He allegedly punished and executed innocent men, and pardoned others who had been legitimately convicted. He rudely rejected imperial gifts, the most egregious occasions of this, being a time when he was sick and Wendy had sent him some nice fruits and a get well soon letter, and the other being when his kingdom had been engaged in some minor skirmishes with the tribal people on its borders, and Wendy had sent silk to clothe the Chinese soldiers. He also intercepted and prevented messages that the Minyue, a group of tribal Yue people who lived on the southeast coast, were sending to Chang'an. From the sources that we have, it seems like Liu Chang basically had a giant ego, ruling his kingdom like a tyrant just because he could, and refusing any outside help. In 174, he went a step too far. He and a lot of his ministers started plotting a rebellion. They sent envoys to the Xiongnu and the Minyue to see if they would help in an attack. When the Han agents first discovered the plot, they wanted to arrest a man named Kai Zhang so that they could interrogate him and find more evidence, but Liu Chang refused to hand him over and ended up murdering him so that he couldn't spill the beans. Following this, Liu Chang was summoned to the capital. Perhaps confident that his older brother would forgive him, he set forth for Chang'an. When he arrived, Wendy's high ministers recommended that Liu Chang be punished for all that he had done, stating that the appropriate punishment according to the law books was for him to be executed and his body exposed in the marketplace. However, Wendy replied, quote, I cannot bear to inflict upon the king of Huainan the penalty prescribed by the law. The ministers insisted that Chang be punished according to the law, but once again Wendy refused, telling them that he would not execute Chang, but would agree to deprive him of his kingdom. The officials then recommended that he be exiled to Shu, the southwestern corner of China that Gaozu had originally ruled as King of Han. Wendy agreed to the exile, although granted Chang more generous conditions than the ministers had recommended. Upon this decision, Yuan Ang spoke up again to Wendy, but this time he argued for the benefit of Chang. He said, quote, The King of Huainan has always been willful by nature, and yet your majesty failed to appoint strict tutors and chancellors for him. This is the reason things have come to this pass. Moreover, the king is a man of stubborn spirit. Now you have suddenly struck him down, and I fear that, exposed to the dew and damp of the road, he may eventually become ill and die. What would happen if your majesty should incur the name of a fratricide? While Yuan Ang had wanted to reprimand Chang, he did not want Wendy tired with being responsible for the death of his own brother. However, Wendy did not listen to Yuan's fears saying that he intended to recall Chang after some time in exile. Just as Yuan Ang had warned, Chang died along the road. Those who were transporting him were so afraid of him that they did not open his prison car along as they went. Remember, he was a strong man who had killed before. In some weird mixture of stubbornness and repentance, Chang had exclaimed, quote, Is it because you fools take me for a man of daring that you are so afraid? What have I to do with deeds of bravery? 
I have come to this because I was too willful to learn my own faults. Who can bear, in the little space of time which is a man's life, to suffer such sorrows as this? And after that, he resolved to starve himself to death. Because the men were so afraid to open up his carriage, they did not notice that he had stopped eating. It was only when they reached Yong County, when the local magistrate decided to check on Chang, that it was discovered that he had perished. Wendy was distraught at what had happened. He apologised to Yuanang, saying that he should have listened all along, and asked what he could do. Perhaps trying to free up some positions for himself, Yuanang recommended that Wendy execute the Chancellor and the Imperial Councillor for their part in recommending that Chang be exiled. However, Wendy declined to do this, and instead investigated all the men who had escorted Chang and ought to have been checking on him. These poor souls were all executed. I have to say, for all his talk in his edicts about taking personal responsibility for the disorder in China, this episode seems like a bit of a blotch on Wendy's record. I mean, he had agreed to the exile after all, despite the warnings of Yuanang. Well, maybe executing those escorts was considered a way for the emperor to take responsibility for his own mistakes. The land of Huainan was at first put under imperial control. Out of respect for the memory of his brother, Wendy and Fief the sons of Liu Chang as Marquises in 172. However, Wendy was still troubled by the death of Chang. We are told that a song became popular among the common people that implied that Wendy had exiled Chang out of greed, so he could bring Huainan under his own control. In order to signal that this was not the case, he re-established the kingdom of Huainan 168, putting the king of Chengyang on its throne. He also granted Chang a posthumous name, King Li, which means cruel. This might seem a bit disrespectful, but it was actually a pretty good deal for Chang. Most kings who rebelled did not receive the honour of a posthumous name at all. A few years later, in 164, Wendy simultaneously made further amends to Chang, while following Jia Yu's program for reducing the kingdoms. He split Huainan into three new kingdoms, and granted them to Chang's sons. The king of Chengyang, who had been ruling Huainan, was transferred back to Chengyang. The final case of feudal gerrymandering came later in the same year, 164. The king of Qi, Liu Zhe, died without heir, presenting Wendy with an opportunity to once again act the generous ruler and to cut up a strong polity into several weak ones. He divided the territory of Qi into six more kingdoms and made sons of Liu Fei their rulers. These new kingdoms, in addition to Chengyang, which had been established at the start of Wendy's reign, meant that the former land of Qi was now divided into seven kingdoms. This was a significant achievement. If you remember from the episode on Gaozu, Qi was considered a very strategically favourable part of China, almost as much as the Guangzhou region, which formed the imperial heartland. Gaozu had been advised that, that it could only be trusted to one of his own sons. Wendy had instead created a situation where the strategic territory could not be utilised by any single man without subduing the multiplicity of kings who now inhabited it. Around this time, Wendy made another, more symbolic move to chip away a bit at the kingdom's power. At the onset of Han, kingdoms had been responsible for the maintenance of any religious sites that happened to be within their territory. Wendy decided to put such sites under the jurisdiction of officers of the central government. It's only mentioned briefly in the records, and I haven't seen many historians commentate on it, so I don't have much to say. <laughs> Day Jihai of the sixth month of the seventh year of the latter period of his reign, the 6th of July 157 BC, Wendy died in his palace. He was young, being in his mid-forties, but no explanation for his death is given in his chapters in the book and the records. In his testamentary edict, 
he lived up to his reputation of concern for his subjects and personal humility. He decreed that the people should only mourn him for three days, a great boon, as the usual longer mourning periods of emperors entailed all sorts of obligations and restrictions on behaviour. His actual funeral rites were to be simpler than previous emperors, and his concubines who had not bore children were to be allowed to remarry, rather than being assigned to take care of his tomb. He did this because, in his words, In the world today, because all men rejoice in life and hate death, they exhaust their wealth in providing lavish burials for the dead, and endanger their health by prolonged mourning. I can in no way approve of such practices. The edict contains a section of Wendy's reflections on his reign. Quote, For over twenty years now, I have been allowed to guard the ancestral temples of the dynasty, and with my poor person have been entrusted with a position above the lords and kings of the empire. With the aid of the spirits of heaven and earth, and the blessings of the sacred altars, peace has been brought to the region within the seas, and the empires without armed strife. I, who am without virtue, have been in constant fear that I might commit some fault to bring dishonour upon the virtue handed down to me by those rulers who went before me. As my years of rule grew longer, I trembled lest they should not reach a just conclusion. Yet now I have been permitted to live out the years which, have, which heaven granted to me, and graciously allowed to serve the temple of Emperor Gaozu. For one so unenlightened as I, is this not a case for rejoicing? Why should there be any sadness or sorrow? If this is a genuine expression of his feelings, and I for one don't doubt that it is, then I think it's easy to see why he was one of the most celebrated emperors in Chinese history. His virtue as a ruler was that mixture of humility, concern for the people, and respect for his ancestors that was most highly esteemed in traditional ethics. When Wendy's son, Jingdi, assumed the throne, the new emperor memorialised his father by putting him on almost the same level as Gaozu himself. In the edict, Gaozu was referred to as the great founder of the dynasty, celebrated for his impressive accomplishments, and Wendy is referred to as the great patriarch, celebrated for his virtuous rule. Jingdi also provided a nice summary of the accomplishments of Wendy's reign. Quote, when Emperor Wen the Filial ruled over the empire, he opened up the passes and bridges so that it was as easy to travel to distant regions as to those nearby. He abolished the laws against treasonable talk, did away with mutilating punishments, bestowed gifts upon the aged, and in his mercy took care of the homeless and orphaned, so that all living creatures might find succour. He restrained his own tastes and desires, and would not accept gifts presented to him. In no way would he seek for personal gain. He abolished the laws which enslaved the families of criminals, and refrained from punishing the innocent. He did away with the punishment of castration, and sent the women of the palace back to their homes, for he held it a grave matter that families should be left without heirs. Sima Chang concluded his chapter on Wendy with a line from the Confucian Analects, quote, When a dynasty is founded, a generation must pass before there can be truly benevolent government, and that, if good men rule the state, they may, in the course of a hundred years, succeed in wiping out violence and do away with capital punishment. The implication was that Wendy had nearly achieved this utopian vision. Bangu finished on a similar vein, noting that throughout his reign, there were only a few instances of capital punishment, so that, quote, he almost succeeded in setting aside punishments without using them. Modern historians have tended to agree with these positive assessments of Wendy's reign, recognising it as a period of peaceful consolidation after the upheavals and unrest that characterised the early period of the Han Dynasty. However, they also wonder whether Sima Chen may have exaggerated Wendy's virtue as a means of subtly criticising Wu Di, Wendy's grandson, and the reigning emperor during Sima's lifetime. We'll get to talk a bit more about that when we get to the episodes on Wu Di. Homer H. Dubbs, the translator of Van Gogh's Book of Han, also charges Wendy with being overly superstitious. Wendy interpreted a lot of events in the natural world as signs from heaven, which was of course not unusual at the time. Many of the Chinese philosophies of government did not think that supernatural events were necessarily relevant to governance. 
He probably was also more religious than previous emperors. He was in fact the first hand emperor to personally participate in the most important state sacrifice, the worship of the five day at Yong, which he did for the first time in 165. His religiosity probably earned him a lot of respect. However, it was also an aspect of his personality that some men were able to take advantage of. I briefly mentioned Sin Yuan Ping, the man who was executed along with his relatives for tricking the emperor. He told the emperor fake news of divine omens in order to gain influence. He reported to the emperor that a dragon had been seen flying in the sky, and fake discoveries of an old Zhou tripod cauldron and a jade cuff which bore the words, Long life to the lord of men. Allegedly, he even predicted one day that the sun would pause while it was setting, and return to its meridian, which apparently it did. I don't know if there's a way he could have faked this, or if it was some illusion of the light. But Wendy was so impressed by the sign that he started to count the years of his reign again. That's why we have the former period and the latter period. Dobbs also criticises Wendy for being a bit partial in his application of the law. Of course, there's the whole deal with Liu Chang, where Wendy refused to sentence him with execution as prescribed by law. There was also an instance when Liu Xian, the son of Liu Pei, the king of Wu, came to visit Chang'an and was killed by Liu Qi, Wendy's son, and the future Jing Di, over a game of chess. Wendy does not seem to have punished Qi for this in any way. Of course, if you remember our discussions on Confucianism and legalism from the early episodes, there was a certain point of view that said a ruler should be forgiving and lenient towards members of his family. However, there was also the legalist point of view that demanded the ruler be objective and impartial in his application of the law. There's an interesting part in the episode of Liu Chang, when Wendy reflects on Chang's death. He said, quote, The ancient rulers Yao and Shun exiled their own kin, and the Duke of Zhou killed his brothers Guan and Tsai, yet the whole world calls them sages. This is because, in whatever they did, they did not allow their personal feelings to interfere with the public good. Even though he had been upset by Chang's unintended passing on the road, I wonder if some part of him felt it a failing, that he had not listened to his minister's first recommendation to execute his brother. As a monarch and a sensitive soul, it was one of the many hard decisions that Wendy had to make in his life. I think, overall, despite mistakes he may have made along the way, he was always looking to do the best job he could. He did not see his role as emperor as license to indulge himself or to rule as an arbitrary tyrant, nor did he collapse under the responsibilities and pressure of the position and cripple China with a placid, weak-willed ruler. Because of this, and the humanitarian reforms he brought to the empire, I think he deserves his reputation as one of the greatest rulers in Chinese history. <laughs> So thanks for listening again. Um, If you've been enjoying these, I'd appreciate ratings on iTunes, reviews. You can even send me feedback at at offspin-history at tutanota.com or you can use the chat box at my website, offspinhistory.wordpress.com. The usual disclaimers, I'm not a historian and I don't speak Chinese. Just do this for fun. And once again, I'd like to thank Professor Shui Shan Yu of Northeastern University for letting me use his music from the album The Vibrant Rhythm of Ancient Heroes.